I, um, I'm Susie Silbert. I'm the curator of post-war and contemporary glass. Listen, while I'm talking, you are still welcome to um, put in your shout outs and hello in the chat because I know that um, for those of us up here on the speaking end, it is very nice to know that there are people in the room um, and that they're enjoying this as much as, as much as the rest of us. So I'm curator of post-war and contemporary glass um, at, the, uh, at the Corning Museum of Glass. And um, if you have come to a Rakeout Commission lecture before or watch one online, then you might know that every single year I say, this is my favorite night of the year. This is my favorite project. Um, and it's true. And it is especially true this year. The reason that I love the Rakeout Commission is because it's an opportunity to work, um, to work closely with an artist, to realize, you know, ideally to realize a piece that they haven't been able to realize before, to give someone an opportunity to push their vision, to build something in a, in a bigger or more expansive way um, than they have before. And that is certainly true um, this year. But, and I should say, it's also an amazing, it's an amazing testament to the vision of the museum and to, um, to the Rakeows who in, endowed this uh, experience in 1986, um, giving an opportunity for an artist to make a work for the collection. But also, and in particular, and specific to this moment tonight, I am thrilled, um, thrilled to uh, have, to be introducing Leo Tukoski, who um, for my generation, and not just mine, but you know, for a lot of folks, Leo has showed us that it was possible to blend our worlds of interest, that it's possible to forge a new path in glass. Um, for those of us that started to make glass in the early 2000s, like Leo did and like I did, um, that was a world where technique was, was tops and not just any technique, but Venetian technique, which is a great thing. But if you're not feeling, it's a particular language, if you're not feeling the language of Kane, the language of Marini, the language of vessels, it can feel, um, it can feel a little stifling. And what Leo has done from the moment that I met him in 2006 until right now is show us that there are so many other possibilities, that there are, there's the language of Venetian glass and there are other languages of technique and there are so many languages to glass making. And, um, and he's just been making that work happen for almost 20 years. And it's beautiful, you know, it's not just possible to make that work, but it's beautiful and it's energizing and it's powerful. And so I am thrilled to have uh, Leo here and really he's gonna talk in one second. He's here, hi Leo. Um, but before we really, before, <laughs> before I relinquish the stage, which I eventually will, um, let me just give you a couple of clues as to what's happening tonight. So you just heard from me. Now you're gonna hear from Leo. After he's done, I'm gonna come back for a second just so we can all have a moment to be like, yeah, that's the best. Then we are um, gonna watch, uh, I think a pretty incredible video that the, that the museum made. And finally, y'all gonna join me up in the gallery and we're gonna see the piece, you know, as in-person as we can through the screen. So with that, um, thank you so much for being here and take it away, Leo. Thanks so much, Susie. Happy to be here to talk about this uh, 36 Rakow Commission. Um, <clears throat> I'm ready to get started if you guys are. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about my work uh, and we'll field some questions afterwards. So KRS-1 states, that knowledge, wisdom, understanding, freedom, justice, equality, food, clothing, shelter, love, peace, and happiness are the jewels to life. These are also known as the 12 jewels from the 5% nation supreme understanding. Hugo Martinez states, graffiti writing is a way of gaining status in a society where to own property is to have identity Graffiti beautifies letters and uses writing as a means of reclaiming and liberating the power of text. It uses style as confrontation.
shine the light that knowledge ignites. Neon was the ideal medium for me. As an undergraduate, it made sense to combine the linear qualities of graffiti with the technical processes of neon signage and sculpture. Graffiti is a form of street art. It connects people. It is embellished and it is bombastic. Hip hop at its purest form is an artistic form. It's also a form of knowledge and cultural production. Hip hop is music, but it is movement. It's writing. It's wordsmithing. And it also creates its own form of expressions. The craft of glass making is also a form of knowledge as well as cultural production with a deep history of art and industry. It self draws on technical traditions to create artistic and utilitarian forms. Hip hop is about layering. <clears throat> I started layering iconography and styles from graffiti with glass making techniques seen here using the Swedish grawl technique. Grawl translates loosely to grail. It's also seen here using this enamel technique Stylized lips are the focus here rather than ornamental design. Not until you've heard Rakim <clears throat> on a rocky mountaintop have you heard hip hop. Extract the urban element that created it and let an open wide countryside illustrate it. Places like Vermont, where I got some of my earliest skills, Alfred University, down the street from Corning, New York, and Pilchuck Glass School. Those are the mountaintops <clears throat> where I could illustrate and start to realize these connections between hip hop and glass, like this glass graffiti totem. This was a collaboration, another focal point of hip hop. From mountaintops to mosque tops, was my next move. The Temple of Holy Wisdom, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul is a place that contains many layers of history, many layers of style, and of course, many layers of philosophy. Learning about Islamic art and architecture became a part of my artistic research, my artistic drive. Again, I drew parallels between graffiti and this time through the calligraphy of the Ottoman artists. A door in Brooklyn, a ceiling in the dome of the Hagia Sophia and a young budding graffiti artist. 
the Sultan's signature or Tura is definitely one of the illest hand styles I've ever seen. Hip hop reconfigures prefabricated snippets and samples to generate new and unique forms. This ancient Alhambra plaster carving became a jumping off point for some of the works that I created. Calligraphic inscriptions with floral motifs <clears throat> that look bi biologic in essence, but upon closer look, have a much more detailed and wordy context. MC, DJ, breakdance and graffiti are the elements of the culture born of resistance. Hip hop is an expressive form of resistance and at its most enlightened, contains ideals of self-determination and seeks self-knowledge as well as attaining a political consciousness. Layering here geometric motifs with stylized letter forms overlaid with the silkscreen process on glass. I add glass making as an element of hip hop drawing connections between the physicality of making glass, the history of hip hop and its connections to Islam to use it as a vehicle on the quest for deeper meaning. Little did I know those connections were already subliminal. This Gravedigger CD from 1997 drawn from an early salmonid ceramic plate in fact, artists like Wu-Tang Clan, Rakim Allah, Erica Badu, and again, KRS-One had something in common in the, in the artist's work that I was appreciating from them. They all spoke of a science, the science of the supreme understanding. They try and project the image to the public that this, this is being done by thieves the and thieves alone. And they ignore the fact that no, it is not thieves free alone. It's a, it's so a corrupt, doing. vicious, hypocritical system. That the supreme understanding is a study of the supreme alphabet and the supreme mathematics, a practice of breaking down numbers and letters in order to reveal their deeper meanings, to achieve a deeper understanding of life, yourself, and the world around you. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding are respectively one, two, and three. Mathematics is knowledge plus wisdom equals understanding. Working in neon or blown and sculpted glass, I'm now embodying elements of hip hop. I'm looking to disrupt dominant theories of knowledge by offering alternative ways of reckoning with history and promoting a challenge of sanctioned forms of knowledge. Even within the canon of graffiti and by default hip hop. Glass forms that embody the icons of graffiti and hip hop are a departure from those four 
traditional elements, kind of unorthodoxy or sectarian hip hop. Using the transparency of glass and its malleability to make three dimensional graffiti forms, but also to embed other symbolism into them. Mathematical vegetation, Kufic scripts, and other geometries. At times, <clears throat> taking the graffiti directly off the wall and hanging it in midair, creating a three-dimensional existence of some of the well-known icons, subtracting color to create a purity of form. Working with other materials is also a kind of disruption, self-imposed, albeit. It helps me think about the materiality of glass a little bit differently. It helps me figure out different layering strategies, working with paint, stencils, and focusing on geometry. Geometry is an image of the structure of the cosmos, a mathematical representation of the universe. It can be used as a system to understand various features of the universe and reflects the purest forms of nature. Plato initiated that thought and its design was embellished by Islamic artists and artisans. At times, these investigations translate directly into my glass making process. Again, taking traditional methodologies like the roll up and the ancient technique of enameling, I'm able to investigate new forms from the layering of all these different influences or samples. Go ahead. Where am I at, Chris? One thing the four elements share is movement. B-boys move across the floor. Writers move across the wall, down the train. DJs and MCs move the records and they move the crowd. In glass blowing, we move the pipe. We turn the gather. We rotate the cutting wheels. We use the elements of fire and water. And we collaborate.
these works are the result of an international collaboration, something inherently hip hop. Shocking to think that hip hop made it across the world before the invention of the internet. Working with like-minded people like Simon Klenel from Stockholm, Sweden, we put forth new investigations in the material. We combined our styles and our techniques and our passion for the craft. We worked within different spaces, different places, Brooklyn, Stockholm. And we inserted our works into those places, staking a claim as a collaborative crew. Oftentimes it's about history for me. <clears throat> history intrigues me. The history of people, the history of craft, those traditions that have passed from generation to generation through millennia about how people say things with their hands, how they express their cultures, and how they share their cultures. The written word is especially important in history. And the written word in public on the walls of society is important. It's history's prominent mode of communication and is lasting. and is something that is pervasive throughout every culture in the world. In the Medinas and the bazaars and the souks of the Middle East and Near East is where layers of history and people exist and have always existed. Walls are covered in goods trinkets and food, stalls with bustling with commerce, hives of humanity. There's something about the layering of copper pots, honey sweets, and leather that is all encompassing. There's a busyness that is both aesthetically pleasing and pushes up against your senses in a way that you never forget about. Hip hop is thought to be four things, four elements four components, graffiti, break dancing, the MC and rappers, and the DJs 
or music makers. Those are the masters that I draw inspiration from. Those are the methods of expression that I gravitate towards. Those are the non-normalized, non-mainstream artistic canons that I promote. And that I work towards in my own practice. Because hip hop represents an antithesis to the hegemony, hegemonic systems and patriarchy of our contemporary society. It butts up against traditional norms and ideas of normalcy and preaches that pushback. Hip hop places me. Hip hop is a true American form of craft, art, design, technical prowess and technique. And in its making, hip hop is inherently sample based. The sample is a snippet, a flash of memory, a nostalgia. It's even a new feeling that is pared down to a unique moment. And that unique moment is looped, tessellated, cut, scratched, remixed, blended to create a pattern that's layered for a new composition. Four traditional elements combine and utilize this sample methodology to create new forms. And that methodology informs my own approach to craft. Glass making is the fifth element of hip hop. Thank you. Leo, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing so much. And now you get to have like a, a break, which is probably good because we're gonna watch the video and first we're gonna hear from the museum's videographer, Brad, and I'll just let you guys all know Leo opted to be surprised. I didn't ask you if it was okay that I told the people but, but, by the video. So he hasn't watched it yet, yet either. So it's like <clears throat> high stakes premiere, at least for me. Um, anyway, with that, I'm gonna pass it to Brad who is really such a good colleague, so good to work with and um, thank you. Thank you, Brad, for making this thing and for coming out from behind the camera to be in front of y'all, so take it away. Thank you, Susie. Um, honored to be here, really. Uh, uh, as Susie said, my name is Brad Patoka. I am the um, lead video producer here at the museum. Um, and I just wanted to talk about um, some things with this project from the video side, um, sort of the history of this project series, um, what it means to us to be doing this. Uh, as well as kind of our goals with this project that we've been continuously building on year after year. Um, I've been involved in this project since 
2016, I believe was my first year. Um, and since then, this project has been one of the annual projects we find ourselves really putting an emphasis in and continuing to grow um, uh, in the digital media department and alongside Susie. Um, we really just look to grow this project year after year in terms of like our production scale and then really the quality of our visual storytelling. Um, our goals for this project have has always really been to just tell a deeper story into who the artists are um, as a person, as well as uh, a deeper dive into their work, their influences and their inspirations. Um, and this is all while hoping to help the artists with their goals, promote the artists and, um, you know, really just do their story justice um, as best as we can. So uh, we've always tried to do this by really using the Raycow Commission piece, the work itself, as kind of a jumping off point for the various story angles uh, that we uh, find ourselves exploring and diving into. Um, and this all starts with just that initial conversation with the artists themselves and just really, again, just a deep dive into who they are, what they're trying to say. Um, so we almost use the Ray Cow piece itself as a character. And then from there, we can connect and expand onto these larger narratives, um, either ones within the artists themselves, again, like their personality, like who they are, what they're trying to say, or connecting it to other narratives and aspects of things happening uh, around the world. Um, and I guess just what I will say is like what we as a team really like about this project, what I really like about this project is just that it allows us to spread our wings, if you will. Um, the uniqueness of these artists' stories, uh, the, the complexity of the work they produce really allows us to flex our creative muscle and break out of the sort of routine things we do day in, day out. Um, at the museum, not that, I mean, everything's fun that we do, don't get me wrong, but these are especially fun and unique. Um, and then beyond that, it really challenges us to change up our production style, the way we do things, the way we have to do things if we're really trying to adequately tell these artist stories. Um, so uh, with all that being said, I hope you all enjoy the film. Um, I'm again, very appreciative to have been involved in this project. Um, Leo was incredible to work with, um, his work and his process are really compelling and unique. Um, so thanks to Leo, Susie, and everybody at the museum who's, uh, been involved in this. Thanks again. Hey y'all. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Leo, I hope you enjoyed that. Hope yeah. it wasn't too awesome. That's was awesome. dope. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I, that's even higher praise. I was just hoping for, you know, not totally cringeworthy. It's scary to watch yourself on screen. Um, so here we are in front of the piece, um, which is in this section of the, which is in the section of the new wing of the museum that I didn't quite realize until Leo was here installing and painting on the wall, but so many of the pieces seem like uh, pieces about painting and about painterliness. Um, so anyhow, I'm here, maybe we can like zoom in, maybe we can get closer because the thing that you can't see in any of this, that you can't see until you're standing in front of the piece, like close to the piece is how ridiculous it actually is that this piece is, is made. Like, and I should have brought a box to stand on so I could still be, still be in the picture. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Leo some questions, but I want you guys to know you can put questions in the Q and A um, if you have questions for Leo. Um, but Leo, you know, like Leo and I have been talking and we've been working on this um, for a long, you know, for a long time. I'll show the piece. I can be off screen. It's okay. They just need like, you know, some, some peek, some peek at me. Um, Matt. So it had been a while. I've been working with Leo. I think it was my, you know, it was like second studio visit. And I was like, wait a second, wait a second. I think I, I've been around glass. I think I know, but what you're doing is actually insane. So can you tell the people like these pieces that we're seeing 
Are they um, mold blown, Leo? No, no, they're all sculpted uh, individually using um, a kiln shelf and some some custom made uh, high temperature ceramic paddles that I've made. So um, me and my assistants, my trusty assistants, um, again, special thanks, Isaac Takoski, Shuhei Fuji uh, for turning pipe on this thing. But um, between their balance and my uh, sort of mashing, <laughs> we, we sculpt these individual forms. So um, we're not like slamming out glass into a mold. They're all unique and they all have these very hard edges, are squared off and um, definitely off, off symmetry axis. Um, which like there's a lot of glass people in the audience, but for folks that aren't glass people and haven't spent that much time in the hot shop, that's ridiculous. Uh, glass is a uh, glass blowing is a um, you know is a medium that's about the bubble. It's about kind of roundness, and so to make these pieces flat and have um, these shapes and angles is it 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 actually like it actually hurts me because that's not all that you're doing. You're carving the surface. You're cutting into the surface. You're writing on the surface, and then um, you're picking them back up. And somebody asks, "I'm going to get to these questions." Uh, somebody asks, "Like, are the pieces hollow?" Yeah, yeah, they're all they're all sculpted bubbles. Um, so that is that's like another like fifth dimension where we've got to control the airflow in and out of the piece. Uh, highly stylized punty work for people who are in the know. Um, yeah, and that's what gives them some, the transparent forms have this like linear, basically the outline to the letter forms and the stars and the arrows um, where the glass is very thick. It creates this graphic line work on the outside of the glass as well. So um, it's important that they're hollow. Awesome. And um, Beth Littman has a question. Beth Littman's question is, can you speak more about the importance of collaboration in hip hop and the parallels with your practice? Sure. Um, I mean, you know, like the, the MCs move even in the, so in the early stages of hip hop, like the DJ was, was making breaks with two records and they were the only one on stage. But then there was the B-boys who were dancing and B-girls, quite frankly, who were dancing to the, to the DJs. Finally, the DJ had a had a hype man or an MC to help to help the party keep going. So, like, you know, the the work doesn't really come together unless you've got people working with you. Um, and so, there's like a technical collaboration, technical collaboration as well as aesthetic collaboration. Like, the, my team that I trust with these bubbles to keep them on the pipe, as well as people like Simone, Simon, and um, and others that I've worked with in the past to put together other aesthetic uh, compilations. And I think that 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 cooperation or collaboration, it spurs creativity. Um, there's a little bit of competition in there where it's like, oh, like I got this, what do you got? Let's let's do a little back and forth. But then that competition culminates into this, sort of singular form you know if you if you go and hear uh two mcs battle on this on a stage there's something really unique about that and that quote battle that sort of like back and forth between each other isn't really about like a a, a rivalry even though it's sort of staged as much but that rivalry spurs creativity within each of those MCs. And I try and like glean that when I, when I'm thinking about collaborating with other artists or, and as well as again, like the, like almost most important collaboration of the team of glass makers who are with me on the pad. Um, so thank you. And uh, another question from another very great maker in the, in the audience. Um, is well it says all kinds of nice things thank you leo this was amazing to watch big congrats but you spoke of aha moments in relation to list to listening to some older hip-hop again 
um, from a new vantage point. Did you have a similar moment in making this work? If so, could you speak to that? And while you're rolling that around, here's another one that's kind of related, which is like kind of to take us through the process of making the composition. Like how do how do the piece it how does it come together in the overall? So I think maybe, you know, how did you get? I think both of those are about like how did you get, you know, from the the work in the studio to what we see here? Yeah. Um Johnny boy, what's up, man? How you doing? Thank you. Um aha moments. I mean, I think you know, the creating the rack cow was, was just that was creating a new work from something. Susie didn't come in the studio and, and point to what she wanted on the wall. She, her and I discussed, you know, creating something new. So there was a definite, like I had to go back into my notes and re read and re listen to everything that I've been interested in and, and dealing with, um, I had been working sort of in line alphabetically. The last slide in my talk was a group of A's. So it made sense to sort of work with the B at this point from a technical standpoint. Um, glass blowing in general is hard. I don't care who you talk to. Um, and then to work in this, in this sort of methodology is it's, I'm, I'm, I'm working at the apex of my technical um, knowledge right now. So what I'm doing, and this is sort of like rolls that second question in is like, what I'm doing is I'm like investigating these forms in real time in the shop. I make, I make a number of things. And, and these things are like, again, these are deconstructions of graffiti iconography, graffiti forms, um, so as I'm like trying to perfect these deconstructed items, arrows, stars, letter forms, other flourishes, crowns, um, they start to exist together as they come out of the kilns. They start to become this like grouping in the studio. And then the, like the, the breath gets added to it after that. Um, even Can though I jump in? It's sort of a cyclical process. Sorry, sorry, Leo, sorry to interrupt. But a lot of people are also wondering um, specifically about the metal framework and like, well, one question, who makes it? And another question, part of the last question that I didn't get all the way through was, um, when does the metal working part happen? So you got the glass, like I'm paraphrasing, you, have, you make all of these glass pieces and then there's a composition process. So it's a little, you know, like it's a little bit like you have a bunch of samples and you're working them around to see if they click. And then can you talk us through the uh, metal and then tell the people, when did the uh, graffiti on the wall happen? So, right, so make a bunch of glass and then I plot out, I like, I take my, I take my markers and I, I draw the metal forms and they're reminiscent of clouds and Arabic calligraphy and other gestural movements found in both of those traditions. And then I fabricate the metal. I bend the steel, I cut it and I weld it and I engineer it to hang and hold the glass. Um, and so that goes on the wall and it holds the glass. And then I step back and then I start to plot and plan the, the painted work, which couldn't happen until we hung the glass and steel uh, in the gallery last week, rolled up to Corning, brought some stencils, brought some paint, uh, laid down some, some, some images and some words. A lot, of the, a lot of the text in there is B words like born and breathe and breath. Um, but there is also some other cryptic imagery like like the number two and the word wisdom so born b b is the second letter of the alphabet which is the number two um two also symbolizes wisdom within the supreme alphabet uh so that sort of like collection of uh symbology starts to play out in the in the stencil and the graffiti and the and the forms you're looking at there are the geometric forms 
again, deconstructed, lifted from Arabesque and Islamic geometry and imagery, cut into stencils. Um, I've, I'm, I mean, I've also trained myself to draw the, the mathematical geometry as well. Um, it's, it's not lifted from, a, from an image. I have mathematically plotted these and calculated them, cut them out in stencils. And then I lay them out in a way that is a little bit less organized than say a, a massive tessellation, but it's still reminiscent of that, um, of that imagery. And um, are we at time, Matt? We can keep going. Great, we we'll keep going. So lots of so, so I will say also, I will editorialize, and I also say that the process is like iterative. That you're, you know, you're making the pieces, and you're thinking through the pieces, and you're thinking through like what are the components. Like you always knew the metal was going to be part of it, because, because my friends. Did you know that Leo worked in metal before he worked in glass? It's hard to believe it. Um, for, for those of us that have known Leo as a glass person um, in particular, but the, the metal came first. So you knew that, but the paint, um, the paint's always been part of your process, but you know, that was a later addition into this particular piece, I would say. Agreed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Somebody else asked a question about color palette and um, color palette in the paint in specific, but I think that the whole color palette is good. Um, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I will say that <clears throat> up until this piece, I've been working in a, in a kind of monochromatic state. Uh, a lot of the installations I've done worked with a single color and the variations within that color. And you know, speaking of breath, like we, we wanted to just like breathe out a little bit and see where, where we could go in terms of palette. You know, graffiti has got like, graffiti has almost inspired new colors of paint, new styles of ink and spray paint and tips. So it sort of felt natural to, to try and push through that monochromatic scheme and into some, some different, uh, color palettes and some of the enamels that I'm working with are also a little bit experimental. They're derived from uh, store-bought, you know, art markers, paint markers and graffiti markers where the white has particular chemical com components that, that vitrify and fuse to the surface of the glass under high heat. But I started adding some of my own pigments and trying to experiment with the colors in, in the enamels. Um, and so that's where that like broad stretch of glass color goes to. Uh, in terms of the metal work and the paint on the wall, those colors are a little bit more muted um, simply because I wanted the glass to shine. Um, a lot of the techniques in, in graffiti, in the throw up specifically where you're where you've got like a nice bright color that's got the letter work and then the, and then the outline work and the, and the, the embellishments are a little bit more muted to just prop up that base layer there. So that's the explanation behind the metal work and the paint work it's sort of meant to be a little bit more background noise that props up the, the glass and the colors of the glass. Last question from from another important pal um the person asks you says you've spoken a lot uh, a lot about the influences that cultures and locations in the world have had on your work can you talk about what glass blowers um who came before you were influences on you if any uh yeah sure um this is a question from the greater takaski clan oh nice that's that's yeah Typical. No. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I love and respect most glass traditions historically and contemporarily. Uh, and I think that I look at all of them and draw from them when I'm thinking about um, making work, the, like the enamel work comes not only from, um, you know, traditional European glass enamel work, but also Islamic enamel work that, that they sort of 
developed through their uh, scientific processes. Um, I will say formally, the, the, the actual technical process of this, I, I picked up from Ethan Stern, who's a glassmaker in California. Uh, he, him and I went to school together, phenomenal glassmaker, designer, artist as well, and um, picked up that uh, specific glassmaking process from him. Um, <clears throat> and, then, and then the cutting nature of the glass, I learned from Simon Clanell who is using the traditional Scandinavian cut glass processes in his own work. So um, it's sort of every and all, but not really any of them at all. <laughs> Sampled and remixed. Um, so with that, I will say, I think we're, I think we're good on questions, right? Okay, so with that, I will say thank you, Leo. Thank you, audience. And if you want to know more about Leo, um, there, I say, keep your eye out for New Glass Review 42, which will come out in the fall of 2022, which will have, which will feature um, a longer form uh, interview with Leo's, with Leo. And you can learn, like, crazy important things like some of that some of the color palette some of the cutting just spoiler alert comes from depression glass and uh and um from his grandmother's collection and there are many other hidden gems that we couldn't address tonight and um but may may make an appearance in new glass review um so please keep your eyes on that thank you so much um i think i'm supposed to tell you that uh, the next Connected by Glass is on perfumes and scents, and it's in December. Maybe December, oh, look at that, December 8th. So that's gonna be pretty exciting. Also, this will go on YouTube, so tell your friends, uh, tell your friends to watch this. Um, and, oh my gosh, the most important thing, I got a lot of private messages during this talk, which I appreciated um, very much. And one of them, I think, is a public service announcement that y'all need to hear. I heard from someone that said, um, Leo's work needs to be in every major collection. <laughs> so I agree. You heard me. it here first. Yes. <laughs> um, let's make it happen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susie. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Dimog. Thank you. Thank you all.